Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin. Welcome. Thank you for being here. We have two great guests tonight. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy has a huge announcement, as well as our buddy, Mr. Media, Joe Concha. But before we get to our great guests, I want to talk to you about a few things. The Democrat Party doesn't want to talk about inflation, immigration, food prices, gasoline prices, crime. It, want to talk, it wants to talk about race, and it wants to talk about abortion. So let's talk about race and abortion. But it's time for a true discussion not the lies we get from the media and the tenured leftists and all the rest. Let's talk about the facts. And I won't even go to the Civil War, where the Democrat Party was tied to the hip with the Confederacy, where Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, was a Democrat, where every one of his major generals were Democrats. No, 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 no. And I won't even go to Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal is equal. But I will go to Woodrow Wilson. Let's start there. Woodrow Wilson was one of the great so-called leading progressive intellectuals of the late 1800s and 1900s. He became president of Princeton University, he was governor of New Jersey, and he was elected president of the United States. And as president, he overturned every major pro-integration law that was put in place by the Republicans who preceded him. Wilson resegregated the departments of the federal government. He fired black federal administrators. He was openly sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan. He opposed black suffrage and screened the racist movie Birth of a Nation at the White House. He was even critical of Reconstruction. Less than 60 years ago, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was opposed by 69 percent of Senate Democrats, supported by 82 percent of Senate Republicans. It was opposed by 61 percent of House Democrats and supported by 80 percent of House Republicans. So of those who voted no in the House, 74 percent were Democrats. Those who voted in the Senate, 78 percent were Democrats who said no. And among those who filibustered the legislation for 70 days was West Virginia's Democratic Senator Robert Byrd. And Byrd spoke for 14 hours in a desperate, last-ditch effort to kill the bill. Yet Byrd would go on to serve as the Senate Democratic leader from 1977 to 89, including Majority Leader from 77 to 81 and 87 to 89, and minority leader from 81 to 87. In other words, he was the leader of the Democrats for a very long time in the Senate, despite his background. He was also the longest serving senator in the history of the Senate. He came a long way, did Robert Byrd. As a young man, he was a chief recruiter and organizer for the Klan in West Virginia, and apparently did a very good job of it as a grand Klegel. When Byrd died, he was praised in glowing terms by the leading lights of the Democratic Party ruling class including Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and the rest, and uh, several called him their great mentor. Okay, but there's more. Joe Biden, in the early to mid-1970s as senator, actually worked closely with some of the Senate's most notorious racists and segregationists, including Mississippi Senator James Eastland, who had fought hard against the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 65. He was opposed to public school integration, but guess what? So was Joe Biden. Joe Biden didn't just compromise with segregationists. He fought for their cause, in schools, experts say. And Biden has often bragged about receiving praise from the late Alabama Democratic Governor George Wallace, one of the leading racists and segregationists. Wallace called Biden one of the outstanding young politicians of America. But the Democrat Party's greatest icon was FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, largely due to his New Deal agenda, and it transformed the United States away from constitutionalism and capitalism towards centralism and socialism. And for this reason, more has been done to immunize his reputation from his racist uh, legacy than any other public figure, dead or alive. 1942, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9006, rounding up, the military rounding up 120,000 Japanese Americans, including 70,000 U.S. citizens. They were forcibly relocated to internment camps in remote parts of the country, 10 different military camps in the Midwest, one in Arkansas. They lost their homes, their property, and their liberties. In 1944, in a case called Korematsu versus United States, the Supreme Court upheld the internment order in a 6-3 to decision. 
and Associate Justice Hugo Black, writing for the majority, he led the way to uphold that decision. Now, who is Hugo Black? Black rose through the Democratic Party ranks in Alabama. He was a lawyer for the Klan in the 1920s. He resigned from the Klan, but kept in contact with them. He was elected to the United States Senate with the help of the Klan in 1926. He opposed the wagner Castagon anti-lynching bill and was an intensely loyal supporter of Roosevelt and the New Deal. In 1937, he was rewarded by Roosevelt as the first nominee to the Supreme Court. His overall record as justice is mixed and disputed. He was an activist for Roosevelt's economic socialism, but he also insisted on the strict interpretation of the Bill of Rights, with certain main exceptions. That said, Hugo Black Jr., Black's son, recalling the appeal of the Klan to his father, stated the Ku Klux Klan and Daddy, so far as I could tell, had one thing in common. He suspected the Catholic Church. He thought the Pope and the bishops had too much power and too much property. So Roosevelt's first nominee to the Supreme Court had been an activist with the Klan. And of course, he wrote the majority opinion upholding Roosevelt's internment of Japanese Americans. Roosevelt also established the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, in 1934. You may have used it. You may have heard of it. Its ostensible purpose was to insure mortgages, thereby promoting home ownership. But it furthered racial segregation. Why? It denied insurance in and around black neighborhoods. Incredibly, the FHA was subsidizing builders who were mass producing entire subdivisions for whites with the requirement that none of the homes be sold to African Americans. Did you know that? Of course not. The term redlining comes from the development by the New Deal by the federal government of maps of every metropolitan area. And the areas where you were not supposed to give these insurance backings for the mortgage were black areas. They were called the red areas. Hence the term for redlining. Roosevelt infamously and unceremoniously slighted the great Olympian Jesse Owens in 1936. Owens had won multiple gold medals. The Olympians from 1936 in Berlin, Hitler's Berlin, were invited to the White House with the exception of Jesse Owens. Owens was once asked if he was snubbed by Hitler. Hitler didn't snub me, he said. It was FDR who snubbed me. The president didn't even send me a telegram. Even with lynching going on, I had mentioned that Senator Hugo Black, who'd become a justice on the Supreme Court, opposed the anti-lynching bill in the early 1930s. Roosevelt said he opposed lynching. He was lobbied by his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, to support the bill, but he refused because he put politics ahead of principle. Roosevelt would not support or sign a federal anti-lynching bill, which would have to come later. I want you to think about that, folks. And there's more about the Democrats and Roosevelt, of course even to this day. But the Republicans never stood in any schoolhouse doorway to block little black kids from going to school with little white kids. The Republicans never supported systemic uh, voter uh, suppression or repression, as the Democrats did and they claim today. The Republicans never supported Jim Crow, literacy tests and all the rest of it, ever. And the Republicans never supported lynching. They were the ones pushing bills to end it. That's a piece of history of the Democrat Party. Now, of course, both parties are imperfect. There are exceptions. But the pattern, the malignant, persistent pattern in the Democrat Party goes way back. It's a very evil party. It's a very anti-American party. If they want to discuss race, let's learn our history. Let's learn their history. And let's discuss race. What amazes me with all the talk about tearing down Confederate monuments and symbols and burning their books and all the rest, changing the names of military bases. How is it that the name the Democrat Party persists and continues? Because they control the culture right now. Now, let's talk about abortion. I've got no problem talking about abortion. The big push for abortion came at the beginning of the last century with Margaret Sanger, who founded the Planned Parenthood organization, which your tax dollars have gone to in the aggregate amount of billions of dollars to support. And Planned Parenthood, as they say, 
supports abortion. They pretend that they support other things, but they mostly support abortion. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about abortion? The Democrat Party voted a few months ago, they said, to codify Roe. They didn't vote to codify Roe. They didn't vote to codify any Supreme Court decision or any position other than the most radical position on the face of the earth. What did they want to do? Their bill that they proposed, which the media know, but they cover for them, eliminated parental consent for abortion. It supported partial birth abortion up to the last second of birth. You know what partial birth abortion is? Step one, the abortionist grabs one of the baby's legs with forceps. Step two, the leg is pulled into the birth canal, so they're turning the baby around. Step three, he uses his hands. The abortionist delivers the baby's body, the entire body, up to the neck. Then the abortionist forces scissors into the base of the baby's skull. He then opens the scissors to enlarge the hole. Then he takes a suction catheter. It's inserted into the hole, and the baby's brains are sucked out. Incredible, horrific pain for that baby right before birth, and then the child is removed, having been killed, having been killed. The Democrat Party voted in support of that, and I do not understand why Republicans don't know how to explain that. Now, who is Margaret Sanger, the great, the great feminist who founded Planned Parenthood, as pointed out in the Washington Times by Irina Grosu? She shaped the eugenics movement in America and beyond in the 30s and 40s. Her views and those of her peers in the movement contributed to compulsory sterilization laws in 30 U.S. states that resulted in more than 60,000 sterilizations of vulnerable people, including people she considered, quote, feeble-minded idiots and morons, unquote. She even presented a Ku Klux Klan rally in 1926, spoke to them in Silver Lake, New Jersey. She recounted this event in her autobiography. She said, I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Klan, I saw through the door dim figures parading with banners and illuminated crosses. I was escorted to the platform, was introduced, and began to speak. And in the end, through simple illustrations, I believed I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. In a letter to Clarence Gable in 1939, Sanger wrote, We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. 1939. Her own words and television appearances leave no room for parsing. She wrote many articles about eugenics in the journal she founded in 1917, The Birth Control Review. Her articles included some moral aspects of eugenics, June of 1920, The Eugenic Conscience, February 1921, the Purpose of Eugenics, December 1924, Birth Control and Positive Eugenics, July 1925, Birth Control to True Eugenics, August 1928, to name a few. She was a horrific racist. And it wasn't until a year or so ago that Planned Parenthood and other apologists for Margaret Sanger finally threw in the towel a hundred years later and said, yes, she was a eugenicist. She's the one that have pushed the abortion issue publicly and nationally in the United States. And look how the Democrat Party and the radical left runs with it, runs with it. 79% of Planned Parenthood's abortion activity takes place in minority neighborhoods, mostly black neighborhoods. This is the history of that organization. This is the history of the radical abortion movement. This is the history of the Democrat Party. Now, you want to talk about race and abortion? Let's do it. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.